Okay, welcome everybody to the last session of the forum. We have some really amazing speakers joining us today to teach us all about invasive aquatic plants. So really looking forward to it. Uh, Nicole, who is our communications coordinator, will be moderating again for this session. So I'll turn it over to her. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Maddie. Hi, everyone. I can't believe it's already the last session of forum, but it'll be a great one with um, speakers, uh, all experts in the field of invasive aquatic plants. So really looking forward to that. Um, starting us off, uh, we'll have Michael McTavish and uh, Ian Jones from the University of Toronto. Um, they'll be speaking on uh, the current status of biological control of Phragmites. Um, whenever you're ready. Great, thanks very much, Nicole. Uh, let's just pull this up here. Is that coming through all right? Yep, that looks good to me. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, as Nicole mentioned, I'm going to be providing an update on the current status of our biological control program for introduced Phragmites in Canada. I'm going to be co-presenting this with Ian Jones, and we're presenting also on behalf of colleagues Sandy Smith from the University of Toronto and Rob Boucher from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. The invasive species we're dealing with here is, of course, introduced Phragmites, so Phragmites australis subspecies australis, uh, and this has been named as one of the worst weeds in North America. This is a wetland species that is capable of forming dense near monocultures, as we can see here, uh, that then go on to have a wide range of negative ecological and socioeconomic impacts. To supplement the variety of tools that we already have to manage introduced Phragmites, our team has been working on providing what we like to think of as another tool in the toolbox for Phragmites in the form of biological control. Biological control or biocontrol uses living organisms to gradually suppress a pest like Phragmites at large scale over the long term. And there are many advantages to biocontrol as a method. We are reuniting a weed with its natural enemies that it might have left behind, thereby reestablishing an ecological balance that can help keep that weed in check. Because we're only using agents that are highly specific to their host organisms, this technique is very safe with low off-target environmental impacts. And finally, because these are living organisms that reproduce and disperse on their own, uh, this method is also highly cost-effective, uh, including at very large scales and over the long term. Biocontrol agents that we have for introduced Phragmites are two European moths with stem-boring larvae. So you can see here Archenera nerica and Lanisa geminipuncta as larvae and as moths. <coughs> The larvae are the life stage that do the actual damage to the plant. As they develop, they will mine through three to four shoots of Phragmites, leaving behind boreholes as they enter and exit the stems and killing off Phragmites tissue above that feeding point. This feeding damage will typically kill young stems outright, uh, whereas older stems will be stunted. They'll survive, but they're not able to grow past uh, that feeding damage. And so as a result of this feeding, we see Phragmites uh, reduced in dominance and competitiveness, leaving space for other desirable biodiversity to reassert itself. Biocontrol for Phragmites has been in development since 1998. At this time, an international team uh, worked to identify the agents that we are currently using and conducted extensive host range testing to ensure uh, that they are specific to the target wheat, so they are only able to feed and complete their life cycle on the target plant. Once this was demonstrated, um, this led to the uh, approval to release in Canada. The Canadian release permit was approved for the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in 2019. With that permit in place, this then led way to the first Canadian releases in Ontario. The first years of the project from 2019 to 2023 were focusing on developing a set of core operational protocols for how to rear large numbers of the biocontrol insects how to release them onto the landscape uh, effectively and efficiently, and how to monitor uh, their dispersal, reproduction, impact, and so on. Uh, and so during that time, we emerged with a, a set of these core operational protocols. So with those best practices in hand, the project is now moving on to a third phase of essentially scaling up releases across Southern Ontario. Key to the strategy is the use of what we would call a nurse site. These are locations that have the agents present uh, at them with very large robust populations that maybe have developed over a few years and these near sites will help facilitate spread 
to other parts of the landscape. This can happen um, as the insects themselves will disperse locally, flying to nearby Phragmites. Um, and we're also looking at methods of assisted redistribution, whereby we can go in, harvest agents from these large populations, and then actively move them to sites of our specific choosing. From 2019 to 2023, we've released approximately 21,000 insects across 30 sites in Ontario. As you can see, we've made some effort to um, distribute these across different geographic regions to get as much coverage as possible. We collect monitoring data on damage that the insects do in terms of feeding damage, a number of damaged stems per square meter of ground. Uh, we see that as a summary here across our 30 release sites. We collect that data in the very first year when we release, and then also we will go back in subsequent years to track how that population is doing. Um, we can pull out a few general takeaways from this monitoring data at this point. The first is that the releases work very well. So using our best practices, we release the insects, we go back a couple of months later, and we're able to see initial feeding damage at 92% of those release sites. So to give you an idea of what this might look like, the PVC marker here is, is denoting one of these release points where eggs or larvae were placed. Each of these blue flags is a Phragmites stem that has been fed upon and damaged by the agents. Um, so we're able to quantify that, and we're seeing here a couple months after release, damage and dispersal away from that release point, uh, which is what we want to be seeing at this point. We can also look to the subsequent years. So these would be years where we're not actively releasing agents, we're going back to monitor how they're doing on their own. And what we see here is that encouragingly damage persists. So all sites that had damage immediately following release continue to have damage into the second year. And now we have a third year of monitoring data as well. And we said that damage is generally consistent or increasing. So similarly, we're able to go back into these sites. We can quantify the number of damaged stems that we're finding. But what's really exciting about year two onwards is that this is damage from the offspring of the insects that we released. So when we see this damage, we know that they are able to reproduce and overwinter on the site. And finally, we're also seeing that agents are able to disperse locally within release sites. Uh, we usually release at only a part of a site, um, but we are able to find damage in other parts of those populations as well. So for example, this is a release site near Aurora where we released larvae and eggs around the perimeter of the patch in 2020 and in 2021. By the following year, we run monitoring plots through the center of the patch we find that the vast majority have damage there. Uh, so this is uh, a part of the habitat that they have moved to on their own within a short period of time. So to wrap up this first part of the presentation, in those first few years of the Ontario program, we've seen the development of these core operational protocols. We've seen them put in place with uh, very uh, encouraging monitoring results from the first three years. So looking forward, the increasing focus is going to be on scaling up these releases across Southern Ontario and really trying to build uh, an even more extensive network of nurse sites across this geographic range. So here, I'm going to hand things off to Ian to continue. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, so um, with any kind of early stage biological control release program, all these releases and monitoring needs to go hand in hand with um, a directed research program, some of which Michael has touched on, but it's to give ourselves and practitioners and land managers the best possible information to actually make a successful management tool um, out of this biological control agent. Uh, so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on some of that research that we've been doing over the last few years. And broadly, that research falls under two questions. So how can we improve the success of insect releases? Um, and in that uh, case, I'm going to talk about an experiment we've done looking at the effects of hydrology on release success. And secondly, how can we maximize the number of insects that we actually have to release? And again, as Michael kind of alluded to, what we're looking to hopefully do is move away to some degree from a reliance on lab reared insects um, and move towards a nurse site strategy whereby we can identify um, Phragmites infestations in the field where we know we have solid uh, populations of these agents and then move those agents directly from those nurse sites into other Phragmites infestations. So next slide, Michael.
Yeah, so that first question I mentioned is kind of how can we improve the success of our releases? Um, and we're looking in this experiment at the effects of hydrology. So the site that you're looking at there is at Lynn Shores Conservation Area. Along that kind of leading edge of the Phragmites, there's about 30 centimetres of standing water. And then along the other side of that same linear patch, there are much drier conditions. So we conducted 20 Arcanara Neurica releases along uh, 10 along the wet side and 10 along the dry side of that patch. And in each case, we're doing five egg releases and five larval releases. Next slide, Michael. So this is what those releases look like. You can see those wet releases on the right hand side. So any kind of first instar larvae dropping out of those egg containers or more mature larvae eating their way out of those transferred stems are going to have to traverse some of that standing water before they reach uh, the growing phragmites that they want to infest. So the question we're asking here is, does that standing water represent an obstacle to the success of these release methods? So the dry releases that you can see on the left hand side there, they're much more kind of representative of the kinds of releases we've tended to conduct so far in the program. So about six weeks after these releases, we monitored those release points in the same ways that Michael described, looking at the, um, the numbers of damaged stems surrounding each of those release points. So next slide, Michael. So here's what the data looks like there. You've got the number of damaged stems along the y-axis, and then you have the results for both egg and larval releases in dry and wet conditions. So the first thing you'll probably notice is that those larval releases tend to perform much better. We get more damaged stems. Um, and this is something we've grown to expect. Those larval releases where we inoculate stems are the most effective release form, but they're also labor intensive. So there's a trade off there and there's an advantage to both of those uh, release methods. The other thing you'll notice is that the pattern of success between the dry and the wet conditions is more or less identical. If anything, we see somewhat better performance of these releases in the wet sites. So that's incredible news for the biological control program at this point. It tells us that we can conduct these releases in a range of hydrological conditions and not be too concerned about any loss of efficacy in doing so. So this opens up a, a wide range of new potential release sites for us. All right, next slide, Michael. So the, the other question we're addressing is how can we improve or increase the number of insects that we have at our disposal? And again, one of the things to do that is to move up to a nurse site strategy whereby we're no longer so reliant on lab reared insects, which are time consuming and labor intensive and can be expensive to produce. If we can just transfer insects from one nurse site to new Phragmites infestations, we can save a lot of time and be more efficient at spreading these insects through the landscape. But the idea of collecting um, insects from uh, insect eggs, for example, from a huge field of Phragmites is quite daunting. But that probably is the best way to collect and transfer these insects, is to collect Phragmites stems late in the season in the hope that they contain uh, our agent eggs and then move those stems into new sites. But in order to kind of determine how effectively we can do that, uh, in the past summer, we've been visiting several of our nurse sites, collecting stems and bringing them back to the lab to dissect them to see how many eggs we've harvested. So to give you one example, from one of our nurse sites, we collected 116 stems. We dissected them in the lab and found 367 agent eggs. Um, so we were really happy with that, roughly three eggs per stem. And it was a fairly quick way to amass those numbers of eggs that can be useful for future releases. The data on the bottom on the left shows the positions on the Phragmites stems where those eggs were found. So the vast majority of eggs seem to be laid low down on the stem in the lowest meter or so. So what that means is that when we come to transfer these stems, um, we don't have to carry around the whole cumbersome five meter tall stem. We can cut it down to much more manageable size and then transfer them in setups like you can see on the right hand side there. So we have a kind of vertical um, grid of stems, whereby when the new Phragmites grows up in the spring, it will grow in and among those stems and make it very easy for any emerging larvae to infest the growing Phragmites. And so for the first time this year, we have 18 of those releases set up at sites at Ontario Tech University. And we're excited to be monitoring those in the spring and early summer to see how well those, uh, those releases go. So next slide, Michael. 
So yeah, to summarize, uh, since 2019, when these releases began, we've released about 21,000 of these insects across Southern Ontario, across 30 sites. Early monitoring results have been really, really encouraging. We're seeing successful reproduction and overwintering at the vast majority of sites. And at the sites where we have multiple years of monitoring, we tend to see increased populations or at least increased damage caused by these insects um, as the years go by. So we're really happy that we've developed uh, effective release methods for both eggs and larvae and happy to see more recently that those, those methods are successful across this range of hydrological conditions. So that opens up a huge range of new potential release sites for us. We've been surprised and very and, and pleased with the degree to which we've been able to harvest agent eggs from Phragmites nurse sites. And so those stem transfer releases will be happening for the first time in 2024. So in the short and medium term, the goal for the project is to scale up the release program and to continue to amass this network of nurse sites. And depending on how these different transfer um, releases go, that might be a way to hugely speed up and accelerate the process of doing that. So next slide, Michael. Yeah, so now just time to say thank you to all of our supporters and collaborators. Many of them are here today. Um, and I'll kind of just leave this here for a few minutes before I open up for questions. Hopefully have a, we have still a little bit of time. Great, thank you so much, uh, Michael and Ian, uh, for that great presentation. Um, so we have tons of questions um, in the question and answer box for you. Um, so I'll start with the first one. Uh, do you think it is possible for these biocontrol agents to mutate and start feeding on native plant species over long term? So uh, one of the main steps that happens in these processes is, is based on safety in that permitting. So ensuring that initial host specificity beyond that period in terms of so we know that right now they're just eating introduced right mites. Beyond that, that kind of transfer is, is not a concern and not something that we would expect from the biocontrol agents uh, in that that process is no more likely to happen to the biocontrol uh, species than to any other native species that might be present in the environment as well. We also know that there are a variety of factors that will naturally constrain their populations over time, including uh, competition with themselves, availability of food resources, novel predators that will keep their populations in check and, and so on. So no, that is not a concern. Great, thank you, Michael. Our next question, I'm wondering if there's any risk of the moths causing harm to native species? Yeah, so uh, I think as as Michael mentioned, the kind of the host range testing for these uh, these potential biological control agents is extremely rigorous at this point. So this is kind of in the case of these agents, an eleven year process. Um, so it's the centrifugal phylogenetic method, whereby the most closely related plants that will be that will share the introduced range are tested first. And they're tested to see whether the insects will feed on them, will lay their eggs on them, can complete their life cycle on them. Um, and then this is kind of expanded out to a much larger uh, number of plants that are maybe more distantly related or uh, might be of economic or cultural significance. And it's only after we're completely satisfied that they're very highly specific to the target weed. Uh, that they would ever even be considered as biological control agents. So in terms of modern weed biological control, um, the risk of non-target effects is, is very, very low. Great. Um, uh, next question, were some sites not measured for damage in year two and three, or did most have no damage recorded? Um, so thinking about that, that, that grid, that table of our monitoring results, uh, the fact that we're not seeing some for years of two and three is just a consequence of uh, how old the sites are. So we add new sites every single year and we continue monitoring on an annual basis. So uh, after another year, we'll be filling in uh, more, more sites with year two data and, and so far, so, so on. So uh, what you saw there was just the old sites that we have so far uh, with more and more sites coming down the pipe every year. So that'll be a, a database we, we continue to grow as the project develops. Um, okay, we have uh, a couple more questions. There's um, quite a bit more, um, lots of interest 
Um, so uh, maybe after a couple more, one or two more, um, if you could um, go answer in the chat box, Michael and Ian, um, yeah. if you're okay with that. So Definitely. let's. Um, uh, does anyone have track? Uh, does anyone have? Does anyone track the behavior of their distribution, survival, and effect on native species since 1998? So the 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 program was started in 1998, but that was the very early stages, including doing the foreign exploration to find potential agents, and then all of the um, host range testing and. Uh, the safety testing that goes into it. The insects have only been released um, in Ontario since 2019. Um, and yeah, so at the moment we're monitoring very closely where they go, um, but also developing methods to, to kind of monitor on more of a landscape scale through things like the development of pheromone traps and also the use of uh, drone imagery to try and see if we can actually identify some of the damage that these insects are causing from drone images. So yeah, there is a there is very much a kind of um, a process by which we track their movement and their activity over the early years of the releases. And I, I would add one thing we look at as well, and another example of the level of specificity that we have with these agents is that we are selectively working at sites where we have uh, there are introduced sub, uh, subspecies of Phragmites in close proximity to our native subspecies of Phragmites, which is very similar in many ways, but is of conservation value. Um, and we are seeing um, specificity to that introduced Phragmites. So they're not even spreading to a very closely related morphologically similar plant as well, uh, which just further reinforces from field data what was seen in that host specificity testing that comes before that permitting process approves them for release. And that's something we'll continue to monitor as time goes on as well. Great, thank you so much, Michael and Ian. Um, I wish I could uh, we could keep um, answering questions here. Um, but yes, again, if uh, you'd be able to answer in the chat um, or in the Q and A box, because lots of lots of interest. I don't even think we got through half of them. Um, so yes, thank you so much for that. And I think also some people had maybe a couple questions in the chat as well. Um, so yes, thank you so much for um, your talk and sharing with us and looking forward to seeing more of uh, those answers. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, up next, uh, we have um, a, a Rob Boucher from uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Um, talking on a new weevil for biocontrol of flowering rush in Canada. Um, hi, Rob. Thank you. Hello. Uh, can you see my screen? Looks great. OK, great. OK, so um, we're going to carry on another talk about biocontrol. In this case, I'm going to talk about um, a new weevil for biocontrol of flowering rush in Canada. And the first thing I want to do is acknowledge my co-authors here. I'm really just um, speaking as a representative uh, of the team. So we'll click here. Okay, so today uh, I'm going to talk about just a bit of background on flowering rush biology, uh, and then I'm going to go into a bit more about how the host range testing was done for this particular weevil, Bagus nodulosus, which will hopefully uh, clarify some of the questions in the pre from the previous talk, as well as the answers of Ian and Michael. Um, and then I'm going to finish up talking about the status of flowering rush biocontrol. Where are we at with it? So uh, flowering rush is uh, it's native to temperate Europe, Asia, and North Africa. Um, surprising to me when I looked at it, it was first seen in 1897 in St. Lawrence River mudflats near Montreal. So it's been around for quite a while, reported in herbaria uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, but it hasn't really become on people's radar to Quite a bit more recently and a lot of this may have to do with that invasion curve that many other people have mentioned. Um, it spreads primarily through rhizomes and rhizome buds uh, and there's two forms of it. There's an emergent form that grows out of the water and a submergent form that grows under the water and this is important uh, from the perspective of biocontrol uh, because they're, they're basically maybe two different targets. Um, it's hard to find a, an agent that might affect both of these plants. The other important thing is that it this plant is the only member in the family Budamacemi, which makes it a very unique plant uh, and also a good target because there's not a lot of similar plants that might be fed on by the biocontrol agents. Uh, so it's, it's, it's unique in that way. 
Uh, what does it do? Uh, this is photo is actually in Montana. The, the plant, this is a, a flowering stem here, but the rest of this is all flowering rush. Um, it can impede significantly the water flow. Uh, it displaces native plant species. All that material going into the uh, re, uh, nutrient cycling can alter habitats and nutrient cycling. Um, it's damaging to the recreational sectors. It's hard to boat when there's plants all over the lake. Um, and it's a habitat for other invasive alien species, particularly uh, introduced fish that then uh, can affect native species. So there's a bit of a cascade uh, going on here. Uh, where is it? Well, th this is on a per prov province and state basis. This is zooming in a little bit by county. And so the point to make here is that it's quite widespread, but there's a lot of areas of south uh, eastern U.S. and a lot of water bodies in Canada where it can spread to. We're seen to be a, it's been here a long time, but in terms of it showing up as an invasive, there's a lot of places for it to go. Um, it's important when you're starting the program to figure out what, what it is you're targeting, and this is work done by John Gaskin and colleagues. Um, what we have here is populations of flowering rush collected uh, across North America, uh, and the in this case, we have two key dominant cytotypes, a triploid that's mostly in the West and the Midwest, those are the blue dots, and a diploid variety, uh, which is in uh, the East. Um, so again, important for biocontrol because the agents may or may not be able to use both uh, types of the dominant cytotypes. And this is something we needed to check out. So the timeline for the flowering rush biocontrol program, uh, this one began in 2012 when biocontrol was first proposed and initial uh, exploration for the agents began. Uh, that was followed by stage two, which was an, a host agent selection. So you go through quite a winnowing process to try and find ones that are that you think are specific enough uh, that, that merit carrying on with host range testing. And the three agents uh, that are being worked on are the weevil I'm talking about today, Bagus nodulosa, nodulosus. There's also uh, an agromyzid fly and then a smut fungus that's uh, all of interest because it may be effective against that submerged variety of the flowering rush. The two insects are more likely um, to affect um, the, uh, the, the emergent variety. So why was Bagus chosen as the first agent to, to screen? Well, the good news is it's reported as being specific to flowering rush in the European literature. And this is a good place to start. If nobody else has seen it on anything else and that it is reported as specific, then, then it's a good one to pick for to go with. Um, it attacks flowering rush very early in the field season and thus has, whoops, has a sustained presence in the uh, on the plant. The adults are active from April onwards. So they lay most of their eggs in the spring, but then they keep laying eggs all summer, which means that you have both larvae and adults on the plant putting pressure on it for a sustained period, which is good in terms of control. Uh, both the adult and the larvae, uh, larval feeding has been shown to affect flowering rush. The larvae mine the leaves and the flowering stems, but they also move into the rhizome which is a, also a good attribute in terms of trying to uh, suppress the plant or kill it. And finally, the adults can survive at least two years, which again means you have them out there for a long time and you have the chance for the populations to increase uh, more rapidly. So I'm gonna switch over now and talk specifically about the host range testing with the, for Bagus nodulosus. And a lot of this is to give you an idea of what we go through when we do the host range testing um, addressing some of the questions that were uh, raised in the previous talk. So to begin with, uh, you, you host range testing, you have to design a test plant list. And the way you do that um, is you start out, first of all, looking at the target weed itself and any genetic variants that there might be. Uh, this is, and then following that, you would go out and look at it. Are there any other plant species in the same genus as the target weed? Then you would go out and look at, are there any other plants in the same family as the target weed? And you're always adding representative species to the test plant list that should be looked at to make sure that this thing only eats flowering rush. Remember that I said earlier that this is the only plant in the family Budamaceae. Uh, so all the way out until here, there aren't anything else to look at. So this one's a little bit strange compared to Phragmites, for example. But uh, eventually you get out to looking at plants uh, in other families, but in the same order. 
And there, there are some species that can be added to the test plant list. And throughout the process of adding species to the test plant list, you're always looking to see are there economic species or environmental species of concern um, that should be included. So when you do that with flowering ash, you end up with a list of 45 representative species. Um, this includes, uh, we included three flowering rush genotypes, the one from Europe, uh, as well as the triploid and the diploid that were observed in North America. We have key species at risk or T&E species from other families. And we also have included species uh, that co-occur with flowering rush and could, uh, the insect could basically encounter in habitats that are um, invaded by flowering rush. It's important to note that this list, 45 species, is relatively short for biocontrol. Uh, other plants, such as Phragmites, the, spe the species lists were much longer, more like 80 or 90 representative species, and, and some, like garlic mustard, have been even longer still. So once you have that test plant list, uh, the, the first step is you want to develop, uh, go through a testing hierarchy. And the important thing you have to figure out is what is the in the life history of the insects that you're dealing with, when are they making a choice? Well, in the case of bagus, the adults choose the plant in which they're going to oviposit on. They choose to lay the egg there. And similarly, uh, larvae also make a choice because the larvae move among the flowering rush plants during their life uh, development. They'll come out of one leaf and go into another leaf. So conceivably, they could run into a non-target plant and have to make a choice, uh, do I want to eat this or not? So those are the two stages that we're looking at, adult oviposition uh, and larval establishment. And the first thing we do uh, is start off with a no choice test. So I'm gonna just look at the adults to begin with. The no choice sequential uh, adult oviposition test, the way these tests are done is that the females uh, are exposed to cut foliage in these, in these uh, jars in water. So a single female will be put in to there for two days with flowering rush. That female is then moved to the test plant species for two days and then moved back to flowering rush for two days. This is to make sure that the female is ovipositing before she goes on to the, tar to the target that you're trying to test, the non-target, and that she's also ovipositing when she's finished. So if you don't get any eggs in the middle period, you're pretty confident that it's, it's not a host. And only tests where they laid on both sides of the exposure were considered valid, and there were six replicates of each for each uh, test plant species. So when you do that, there were 45 test plant species offered, and there was only one test species, uh, a European one, that had a single OB position in 270 plus replicates across all the different plants that were exposed. That, so basically, they only laid eggs on flowering rush. Uh, Patrick tried to reproduce this, in other words, doing repeated exposures with this plant species and could not get overposition on it. So it's a single egg that was an outlier uh, and not of concern. Um, there were three species in that list of 45 that had limited adult feeding. Uh, so the adults went and probed to test it to see uh, what it was, and those species were selected to move on to the next tier of testing. So jumping over into the in the hierarchy, I'm now going to just talk about the larval testing that was done. And again, it's a no choice test. Uh, and when it's no choice, the insects are put on these plants and they have a choice. You either uh, feed or you die. Uh, so it's a very conservative test. Often you'll try and eat things if, it, if you haven't got anything else to eat. So how are those no-choice tests set up? Uh, basically, again, we had cut leaves in those cylinders with water. We added three first instar larvae to those cylinders. This is the larvae here. And after five days, we went back to check for dead or alive larvae and whether there'd been any feeding. The results of this after five days on most of the test plant species, the larvae were dead. In other words, they can't survive on a non-target species. In contrast, the larvae on flowering rush had developed uh, and some of them have even molted to the second instar. As you would expect, this is their host plant. Uh, this is the sort of mines that we were looking for in the leaves. So there's there were, again, there were three test plant species, different ones from what the adults chose, that had any live larvae and very limited feeding. And when I say limited, we're talking about less than one larval mine inside the plant material. So they're desperate. They're really trying to figure out if this is something um, that they can eat. 
So once you've done those no test tests on all the plant species, you narrow down again to the three or four species that you've identified of concern after that initial no choice work, and you move to the next tier, which is single choice testing. And I'm going to talk about the single choice testing for adults first. So in this case, we have Budimus, 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 that's flowering rush, and we expose them in the cylinders with the non-target species of concern. Uh, there are five replicates uh, of, of each exposure, and what we're looking for here is, is uh, the for feeding and the intensity of the feeding that the adults might do. Remember, we're not worried in this case about oviposition. There was no oviposition on any of these plant species, uh, we're, but we're wondering, is, is the feeding that we observed in the no-choice test something of concern when the insects have a choice, do they prefer flowering rush? The answer to that is that in the test species, there was only exploratory feeding on single leaves of a few replicates. In contrast, they basically did all of the feeding uh, on the flowering rush plants. They were heavily fed upon. So while they may taste and try the non-target species, um, it's not something that a population um, is going to do sustained damage to or persist on. So jumping over to the three or four species of concern in the larval thing, larval side, uh, we did no choice larval testing for a longer period. I don't have time to talk about those today. I'm just gonna jump to the single choice uh, larval testing that was done. And again, it's the same sort of thing. Uh, Budimus is combined with the non-target species of concern. Uh, larvae are transferred into the tanks. And then basically you look to see uh, the percentage of larvae that were alive and what they were on. And the results are pretty clear. There was nothing alive on the non-target plant. Everything was on uh, the Budimus, and there was far more feeding again. The feeding that we observed on the non-target plant by the larvae was basically uh, exploratory to see, can I eat this or not? So to sum up the host range testing here, and this is why we're confident that this is a specific biocontrol agent, and it's generally what we're looking for when any biocontrol agent is screened to make sure that it is specific. Uh, we've confirmed that Bagus is a highly specific to flowering rush. There were only eggs found on flowering rush. There was limited larval develop, larval feeding observed on three species, but no development. A population cannot be sustained on these on these plants. And also, we tested the two dominant North American types of flowering rush, and both were accepted for oviposition larval development. So that's the host range testing based on that data. And uh, it took eight years. In 2022, uh, a petition to release Bagus in North America was submitted. It was approved for release in Canada in 2022. And that's where we are now, is that we're at the stage five, which is Canadian uh, release studies. And I'm just going to talk about where we are with that. Uh, it's early days still. Um, and basically, what we're trying to do is, is scale up uh, the rearing uh, methods for this insect. It's a tough one to rear. This is the Cadillac of rearing. This is uh, at the Cabby rearing pond in Switzerland where they have flowering rush in the pond. They have a sustained population of bagus. Um, it takes quite a while to get these ponds functional and establishing, and that's what we're working towards doing um, in Canada, as well as getting them out uh, into the field. But that's, that's what we're working towards. Instead, uh, because we don't have those yet, we're doing lab rearing that's been developed by Patrick Hafliger. Uh, and in this case, you take cut leaves of the flowering rush, expose them to a female, female lays eggs. Those leaves are moved over into a petri dish. Then you wait, check them for hatching larvae. Larvae are manually transferred over onto a flowering rush plant and sealed in with parafilm. And then you let those plants grow. It's a lot of transferring, a lot of work, and a lot of handling. So we're hoping uh, that the field, we can get the field set up going as soon as possible. But you can... Uh, produce a small number of weevils uh, doing this, and we're continually uh, working to improve this method. Uh, this is an example, uh, Natalie West's lab in uh, Sydney, Montana, where they're exposing uh, flowering rush plants to the females and males directly. They'll oviposit on them, you rear the plants through, and then you have to recollect, hopefully, weevils down the road. Again, a very labor-intensive, uh, but because the weevils tend to just burrow down into the mud if they're there, uh, once they've come through in development, uh, but you can get uh, a few weevils through. 
So just to sum up the next steps, we, we're at the release stage of a very host-specific weevil for biocontrol of flowering rush. Uh, we currently, we received a small number of weevils uh, from uh, Natalie and Cabby last summer, uh, did some rearing with them, and we currently have uh, a small number of them and exposed plants, similar to what Natalie had in those uh, in that last slide, outside in tanks that were overwintering, and hopefully uh, some of them are going to come through. This is their first winter. Uh, we're continuing to refine the rearing methods and establish those rearing ponds. We have identified two uh, isolated areas for release, and what we're really looking for is isolated ponds with flowering rush as potential release locations, because we don't want to just let them go on the Rideau River and then have them go downstream. Uh, very hard to monitor that way. So we're looking for those isolated ponds. If you have flowering rush in a, that sort of a location, uh, we'd love to hear from you. So that sort of sums up where we're at. I'd like to acknowledge a whole bunch of collaborators that we continue to work with and funding sources uh, down below and happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Rob, for that um, presentation. Um, just check the Q&A box. Um, so we're a little bit over time. So I think we're, um, oh, there is one question. Um, maybe, uh, yes, we'll, we'll do this one and then um, any remaining, if you could go into the question and answer box, sure. Rob, that'd be great. Um, is there any information about field releases in the US? Are there any plans for Flathead Lake in Montana, which is likely the source population? for many of the downstream populations on the Columbia River. Sorry, was it Flathead Lake, you said? Flathead Lake in Montana. Yeah, so they're, they're, the, the insect has been petitioned for release in the United States at the same time as it was petitioned in Canada. Um, and it was recommended for release by the, the technical advisory group and it's moved to the next stage of their regulatory process. So there's definitely, uh, Jen Andreas uh, and folks in Montana are planning uh, if they get permission to release it in the United States, Flathead Lakes is one of the areas that there will be release work done. Yeah. Great, thank you so much, Rob. Thanks. Um, Lawrence, put your email um, in the chat for follow-up. Um, and I'll end with uh, Sarah's uh, statement in the um, chat box. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. And I agree. <laughs> okay. Have a good Thanks. one. Um, okay. So um, okay. Uh, Next up, we have um, a presentation on the management uh, as a management update on water soldier in Ontario waters, um, presented by Cass Stabler from Parks Canada, Rob McGowan from Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, Randall Power from Parks Canada, and Mary Gunning of Quinty Conservation. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Hello. Everybody see that? Looks good to me. Sounds good. Okay, great. Let's dive in. Uh, my name is Randy Power. I work with Parks Canada, Ontario Waterways, Trans Severn Waterway, and I'm here with uh, Cass Stabler, who's a ecologist here at the Waterways, and I'm co-presenting with Mary Gunning, Aquatic Science Coordinator with uh, Quinty Conservation, and Robert McGowan, who's an Aquatic Project Specialist with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. Subject of the talk, water soldier. Very brief background. It's a floating aquatic plant native to Europe and Asia. First detected in the Trans Severn Waterway in 2008. Uh, quickly got on the least wanted AIS list in 2013, but a Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governor's Premiers. And it's uh, a prohibited invasive species in Ontario. It's illegal to uh, possess or own this plant as of from 2016 onward. And uh, eradication and management of the plant are led by the Water Soldier Working Group, which we are a part of. Uh, a bit of background in the biology. This uh, plant has two forms, like the previous presentation uh, subject. Um, there's an emergent form that uh, it starts out in the bottom in the winter and early spring. When it starts to growing, it pops to the surface in the more shallow environments. In the middle picture, you can see a submergent form stays in the bottom in some of the deeper aquatic habitats. And thankfully, this uh, species does not produce flowers here in this, where it is in North America uh, due to its origin. So there's unisex release, I guess. 
And the top right hand corner, it does uh, reproduce two different ways. It produces these uh, turions, these little vegetative buds that break off and, and float downstream. And the bottom right picture, it's it's like a spider plant, so it produces these off uh, offsets or stem comes out and a new rosette and a new plant forms. And um, when it does that, it reproduces pretty quickly. So without control, it will spread pretty quickly. So the, the picture on the top left, 2013, through to September 2015, uh, it spread very quickly without control. How do we manage this? We're taking an integrated management uh, approach. Uh, the working group has uh, uh, developed this over time, but the main management objectives are to provide guidance for pre preventing the introduction and spread of water soldiers to new locations, uh, having an early text and rapid response action uh, for any new populations in Ontario. Uh, eradicate established water soldier populations. Yes, you heard me right. We, it's still a goal to try to eradicate this in, uh, in some portions where it is. Also work with private sector to identify and eradicate water soldiers from private waters in Ontario to prevent further spread. Uh, some of the management options um, in the plan include uh, herbicide, manual removals, uh, Diverse sits the suction dredge uh, it hasn't happened yet, but they're uh, they're uh, being developed for for the plan. Use of bottom barriers and mechanical harvesting. The main focus of the last number of years has been with uh, herbicide treatment, and to do that uh, effectively, uh, surveillance monitoring programs is, is used for that. It it involves a visual check along a pre-established grid on the water. It's a visual assessment. Um, you look for the plant and identify it if it's, it's if it's there, present, or it's a colony. Uh, Water is greater than two meters. There's no visibility. You, you drop a rake in and pull it up and see if there's a plant there. Record the top three plants at each point and uh, a water depth. And this all leads to treatment. So we develop uh, treatment polygons based on the maps that we generate from the surveillance. Herbicide diquat is used or the trademark reward. Uh, applied from shallow water boats, as you see in the photo. Uh, the treatment occurs in October with the assumption that uh, native plants are, are starting to go dormant or not actively growing. Uh, there's a surface and subsurface treatment, so plants are sprayed at the surface and injected into the water column uh, below. And not all areas get treated due to accessibility, and I'll speak to some of those challenges in a minute. Um, the treatment program in 2023, as you see the colors, um, there were uh, 148.9 hectares in total treated through, throughout the system, as you see in the map. Unfortunately, last year we never got to treat all of the areas. There's an area in purple and a small channel um, in the waterway that we uh, didn't have enough uh, resources to treat the entire population, so we had to make some, some uh, priority decisions here. And uh, some successes of this treatment program, there has been a reduction in abundance and distribution through the interventions, some areas by as much as 85%. So the top photo shows the distribution uh, in 2015 at, in Lake Seymour, a portion of the waterway, and the bottom picture, of course, uh, is the same area, 2019. So it really knocked it back. Uh, the public has noticed the improvement. In some ways it's uh, out of sight, out of mind, that it's not inhibiting recreational uh, boat use any longer like it, it had in some areas. So had been successes, but there have been challenges because the map here shows um, 2020, 21, and 22. They, so some areas of the waterway, the plant is still hanging around persistently uh, in spite of the treatment. Um, trying to figure out reasons for that, or is, are we uh, missing elements of the monitoring, missing plants for treatment? We start using drones, um, Overhead drones to fly the shallows in the back bays, see we're missing plants, um, using underwater cameras to find more uh, colonies that might be deep waters that we can't find often. And then there's the effect of, effectiveness of the treatment itself, um, maybe due to flow, due to depth, that the treatment is not, not getting to the plants and we know it's not getting in all the shallow areas. So uh, we have to look at and, and adapt to both those, um, those realities. So a few of the things we're looking at, some of these areas that um, you either can't get to with the herbicide or, um, or are not affected in other ways. We tried mechanical harvesting in 2023 with a 
the truck store machine as you see in the bottom scoops the plants up the, the upper left hand picture is a pond that was uh pictures taken by drone in june uh, a day and a half or so of treatment by two or three machines uh, had the result on the right so it's an effective and quick way to to get out plants in, in areas that we may not uh, be able to shoot otherwise. And of course, good old fashioned uh, manual pulling. There's a few persistent areas in the upper portions of the distribution of the plant that not being knocked out and probably still feeding the areas below. So uh, sometimes the easiest way to deal with some of these relatively small patches is to get in and, uh, and, and pull them out manually. So with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to uh, Mary Gunning to talk about Bay Quickie work. Thank you, Andy. <clears throat> the management for Water Soldier in the Bay of Quinney has followed an integrated approach similar to the Trent Severn Waterway program. I am going to touch on our monitoring because it is an important, an important part of management. At the beginning of 2022, the scale of water soldier populations in the Bay of Quinney were unknown. Along with the knowledge of the Bay of Quinney's characteristics, such as hydrology and habitats, and the use of existing Bay of Quinney monitoring programs, we used eDNA as a tool to help discover water soldier populations. The first step of our monitoring was to perform eDNA sampling. Samples taken earlier in the season were sent to MNRF's Fish Genetics Laboratory and identified as high priority for processing. The samples are analyzed before the end of the monitoring season to help guide decisions on the next steps for vegetation surveys. Using the tiered monitoring approach and public reports, populations were discovered later in the season. Given the extent of the water soldier populations discovered and a short timing window to engage with key stakeholders and permitting agencies, management options were unable to proceed in 2022. The 2023 monitoring season followed a similar approach to 2022 with the addition of spring vegetation surveys earlier in the season to quality check the known populations from 2022. We did experience a challenge when quality checking populations because some of the plants were not necessarily present in the same locations as in 2022. And another challenge presented by the Bay Aquinity monitoring is that the plant is always submerged, which has not been the case for the Trent Severn waterway. The plant pictured on the slide is the most emergent plant that we've seen so far in the Bay Aquinity and it is rooted with just the tips of the leaves emerging out of the water. Next slide, please. The Bay of Quinney has a unique shoreline with diverse flows, extensive wetlands, and sheltered embayments that connects directly to Lake Ontario. The coastal wetlands in the Bay of Quinney are monitored for health using a standardized methodology that is performed in other regions of the Great Lakes on the Canadian side, allowing for the data to be comparable. And the monitoring has demonstrated that the Bay of Quinney coastal wetlands are among some of the healthiest. In addition, the Bay of Quinney has some of the largest coastal wetlands in Lake Ontario on the Canadian side. Uh, one of the largest in the Bay is a continuous connected coastal wetland complex known as Sogwin, which is approximately 2,100 hectares. The Bay of Quinney provides water soldier with ideal habitat conditions to thrive, such as in mesotrophic to eutrophic conditions with slow flowing water bodies, large wetlands and depths averaging up to five meters in the Bay, upper Bay of Quinney. Water soldier does pose a significant threat to the Bay of Quinney ecosystems that the Bay of Quinney Remedial Action Plan and other organizations have worked hard to restore and remediate. The eDNA sampling performed includes nine eDNA open water locations and six eDNA sampling locations within all of the 15 monitored uh, Bay of Quinney coastal wetlands. Next slide, please. With water depths of the Bay of Quinney, the open water sample collection is performed using an integrated tube as pictured, which can capture the entire depth of the water column, providing a more representative sample than a surface water grab. However, the coastal wetland eDNA samples are collected using the standardized grab as per the Invasive Species Center Participants Guide for Aquatic Invasive Species Sampling with eDNA. The open water locations are sampled monthly, 
whereas the coastal wetland is wetland samples are sampled from July and August and only once during the peak vegetation growing season. Overall, the eDNA locations provided good coverage of the Bay of Quinney, and it did lead to population discoveries. Next slide, please. The following map presents the 2023 eDNA results, which did guide our vegetation surveys. Chris Wilson and Francie McDonald presented earlier in the forum regarding eDNA for Water Soldier. So please watch their presentations if you would like more information about the results, advantages, and challenges of eDNA sampling for Water Soldier. Next slide, please. The vegetation surveys followed the same methodologies as the Trent Severn waterway. The attached map is an example of a survey grid. The area pictured is known as Big Island East. Uh, it is a small area of the overall Big Island coastal wetland complex. The entire wetland complex is approximately 950 hectares. There were six EDNA samples collected in this area. And this was a follow-up survey to two confirmed eDNA re results, which are the green squares. And this was a successful following up, leading to the discovery of a water soldier plant within the coastal wetland and a nearby scattered colony. Next slide, please. We also tried other techniques proven to be successful in the Trent Severn waterway, such as drone and underwater cameras. Uh, drone images were captured in the fall of 2023 and they are not yet analyzed. We plan on analyzing them before the next monitoring season. Um, one of the challenges that I mentioned earlier is Water Soldier is behaving differently in the Bay of Quinney than the Trent Severn Waterway. And at this time, we're unsure how successful the drone techniques might be due to the submergence of the plant and the turbidity characteristics of the bay. Next slide, please. This map presents the 2022 population with green points and the 2023 population with red points. The populations do seem to be following the typical wind and flow patterns of the bay. All of these areas, with the exception of Muscogee Bay, were followed up with various management techniques. Muscogee Bay will require further management in 2024. Next slide, please. Overall, the Bay of Quiddy had great achievements. Um, active management practices did take place using the same integrated approach. Uh, management is site specific based on characteristics. It has included herbicide treatments using reward and Priscilacor. Priscilacor is a new herbicide registered for use in Canada with reduced risks such as no drinking water restrictions. A research authorization was granted for the use in the Bay of Quinney. I also, Trent University is conducting a study on its effectiveness. In addition, manual removal and shade, shade cloth management was performed. The shade cloth requires areas with no boat traffic. Manual removal can be restricted due to the size of the population or water depths. Also, 2023 was the first year for active management in the Bay of Quinney. Therefore, follow-up surveys will need to be completed to determine uh, the effectiveness of the management activities. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Rob. Thanks, Mary. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm just going to give you a quick update on uh, some other water soldier populations in Ontario that the working group has been dealing with. So uh, the Black River, uh, uh, which is a tributary of Lake Simcoe, in 2015, we found water soldier. Um, we acted quickly, um, or our district MNRF contacted the working group. Uh, and asked for advice and we said we want to rapidly respond to this because we know what's happening in the Trent Silver Waterway. So in 2015 and 2016 we uh, did a lot of manual removal and had two herbicide treatments uh, in the fall of each year. Uh, next slide Randy. Uh, 2017 we were still monitoring every month in the, the fair weather. Um, we did not discover any new plants. Uh, we were also taking eDNA collections at nine sites uh, each year from 2015 all the way up to 2023. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in, from 2019 to 20, 2023, we're still monitoring, but with special focus on where the populations were, and we were still collecting eDNA samples, and we have not had a positive EDA te eDNA te detection since 2021, and we have not found any plants. Uh, next slide, please, Randy. 
Uh, Red Horse Lake is another population that was discovered in 2020. Uh, Red Horse Lake is part of the Gananaque uh, River watershed. Um, and if you need further um, kind of put your location, it's right beside Charleston Lake Provincial Park. Uh, next slide, Randy. So in 2020, it was discovered. Uh, we rapidly responded, like we wanted to emulate what we did with the Black River to be successful. Uh, we had um, some manual removal efforts and a herbicide treatment, both in 2021 to uh, 22. And could you go to the next slide, please, Randy? And 2023. Um, 2023, we were monitoring. Uh, all those previous years, we had one solid population. Uh, 2023, it broke off into about 13 populations. So we mainly removed all of those populations. And we went back to assess our success or efficacy. Uh, and we found four more populations. So in the fall of this uh, 2023, we treated those newly found populations with herbicide. Uh, next, uh, so thank you, Randy. Um, so private ponds across Ontario, since 2015, we've been getting calls about ponds and, uh, sorry, water soldier and private ponds. Uh, the working group has been addressing them. Uh, we have successfully eradicated 75% of those uh, water soldier from those ponds. And uh, the ones that are yellow, um, either people have moved on, we can't, con we can't get a hold of them. So they're kind of unknown. But the 2023, we did receive a new uh, uh, report of water soldier and pond in Kin Garden. And this other red one over here is a pond that is directly attached to the Trent Severn Waterway. So it's been persistent and uh, we're, we're still uh, moving forward to address it. And on the horizon, uh, where do we go from here? Um, we're in the process of renewing the integrated management plan from 2024 to 20, 2029. Um, we're having success in managing water soldier in the Trent Severn Waterway. Um, but, you know, as Randy was speaking about those persistent uh, populations that we're trying to address, um, and we're trying to be a, a adaptive and, and work forward in uh, addressing those uh, populations. Um, the expansion of water soldier to Bay of Quinty brings its own challenges. Um, you know, it's a vast area. It's huge compared to what we've been dealing with with TSW and it's open water. Um, so the, the plan is moving differently and, and it's settling out in a lot different uh, environments than we're used to. Um, and uh, we don't know how water soldiers going to affect not only the commercial fishery, but the recreational fisheries in the Bay of Quinty. Um, we're constantly looking to expand in partnerships, um, constantly uh, looking for funding to help us address these uh, these populations in the Trent Severn Waterway and across Ontario. And for more information, uh, you can contact Francie McDonald at the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, uh, Val uh, at Parks Canada. Um, you can contact me at the Ontario Federation of Angus Hunters, or I'm sure Mary would be open for a conversation about water soldier with you as well. And Randy, I don't know your information is not on there, but I'm sure you, you'd be open to having a conversation with people. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Cass, Rob, uh, Randall, and Mary for your presentation. It's so great to hear about um, the successes um, with managing water soldier. Um, um, so we'll, I think we're going to move forward um, just in interest of time with the next presentation. But um, if uh, any questions come through to the Q&A box or um, in the chat, um, would you be able to uh, direct your answers over there? Absolutely. Sounds good. Thank you. And also uh, the presenters' emails are in the chat box. Thank you, Lauren. Um, okay, thank you so much, everyone. Um, that was a great presentation. Uh, next up, um, last but not least, uh, I love saying that, um, is Katie Church, I ISC's very own. She's the... Um, EWC field team lead here at the ISC, and she's presenting on European water chestnut control and the story of the rapid response in Welland, Ontario. Um, thank you so much, Kat, Katie, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. And hopefully this is right. <laughs> And are you able to see it? Yes, looks great to me. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry, I'm just moving the thing. Okay. So, um, hi, my name is Katie Church. Uh, I am the Invasive Species Center EWC field team lead. I work out of the uh, Welland in uh, the Welland River in the summertime, and I'm excited to share um, this uh, rapid response that we have. So just an introduction to what I'm going to be talking about, um, the, uh, a little bit about the plant. Um, I'm going to be going over the rapid response in the Welland River, the results, and what's next for the program. So European water chestnut, um, or EWC, is an annual aquatic plant um, with shiny green leaves and sharply that have sharply toothed edges. Um, and they also have these sponge pockets um, um, from this arrow here that help the plant float. So these sponge pockets are underneath each leaf um, and it uh, helps the plant float on top of the water. Um, they have uh, green fleshy seeds attached to the uh, underneath of the plant. And these are actually rosettes you're looking at. Um, so each plant can produce up to 10 to 15 rosettes. Um, and they usually will have a, a small white flower, um, as you can see in this photo here. And um, each rosette can produce up to 15 to 20 single green fleshy seeds. And these seeds are, are obviously attached and they'll detach, um, you know, mid to late growing season and um, go into the substrate for them to grow for the next season. Um, seeds are also sharp and woody. Um, they can be, sorry, they are sharp and woody and they have these um, uh, barbed edges, as you can see in this photo, this is even that picture of the seed here. Um, so not ideal to step on. <laughs> um, this plant thrives in lakes, rivers, and streams that are slow moving and have a soft substrate. And it's a native plant to Europe and was introduced to North America as an ornamental um, plant for the water gardens. Um, in terms of uh, an aquatic invasive species that kind of checks all the boxes, uh, it's a non-native species that's introduced to an area and can cause harm to the environment, economy, or society. Um, and obviously EWC is no exception to that. Um, if left unchecked, it can um, cause economic impacts such as decreasing property value, impacts to commercial fishing, um, social impacts such as uh, preventing boating and swimming in infested areas, and um, the sharp and woody seeds are obviously painful to swim through or step on. Um, and the seeds can also wash up on sandy shores, creating a safety risk. Um, and then ecological impacts such as forming dense floating mats, which can decrease native aquatic plant diversity and shade out native species. It can also reduce light penetration and um, the hardy plant decomposition can lead to decreased oxygen levels, uh, which Im impacts fish. And it also can be um, detrimental to species at risk habitat. So it is a prohibited species in Ontario. Um, it's uh, a prohibited under the Invasive Species Act, making it illegal to import, possess, um, sell or trade. Um, and then this also means that any boaters in infested waters must avoid spreading plants. Um, and if they do find plants on their boats, uh, putting it away so it doesn't end up back in the water, um, putting it far away enough so it doesn't end up back in the water. Um, so the rapid response um, program on the uh, Welland River in Welland, Ontario. Um, EWC populations uh, are have popped up in Eastern Ontario most notable in um, the Ottawa River in Voyager Provincial Park and Wolf Island in the St. Lawrence River, both of which are being managed. Um, and then this report was made in 2020 by a local recreational paddler. Um, and because of its unique shape, um, so it was reported to EDMAPS, uh, which is a citizen science um, invasive species reporting app. And, because of its unique shape and shade of the plant, the uh, it was actually confirmed quite quickly, quickly to be European water chestnut. Um, so in response to this report, the Invasive Species Center decided to take action and survey the river in 2021 to view the extent of the infestation um, to see uh, if it could be eradicated or how much there was, where it was, where it wasn't. 
And it was actually determined that the infestation could likely be uh, controlled or eradicated by a rapid response in the river. Um, and then the method of control that was um, suggested was uh, hand pulling, manual removal by hand pulling. Um, so just something to keep in mind as I continue on with this. Um, so as a result of this EDMAPS report, the um, ISC and the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority um, developed an eradication program in 2022 uh, with support from uh, OFH, uh, Ducks Unlimited, and the MNRF. And local collaboration was key to building this program. Um, so the NPCA provided us uh, with a home base for the field team to store our canoes on um, the boat and the truck. Um, they were our local contacts in case we needed some information about the area or um, just some imp for emergency purposes and community outreach. Uh, the OFAH provided us with a hit squad um, of invasive species technicians that were local to the Welland area. And Ducks Unlimited provided us with um, the expertise in control as they provide control in Eastern Ontario um, and drone mapping. Um, just important to note that uh, this obviously wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for these partners um, and the collaborations that we have um, in order to uh, uh, hopefully eradicate the chestnut in the Welland River. Um, and visual surveys for this plant um, and manual pulling is in July and August. So we have a, a small window to, to get rid of these. In order for us to even begin building a, a rapid response plan, we had to abide by the prevention response plan set out by the MNRF. This basically just details who can do um, uh, control work, um, uh, the activities that are authorized, and the conditions um, when transporting over land of the biomass. Um, this is the area of the Welland River. It is a long stretch uh, that's kind of hard to put on a, a, a map, but uh, we got it on here. And this is um, the area of the Welland River that we, we've been monitoring for the past two years. Um, so in we've been able to extend the monitoring from 33 kilometers to 53 kilometers. Um, and the Welland River actually flows through the Niagara region um, through the Welland Canal, which is this uh, big one here, and the Recreational Canal. Um, so just something to keep in mind when we're, you know, planning out for the day, how, where we're going to go and how we're going to get there, um, that there's a little section here that flows in between um, those two uh, rivers. Um, so hand pulling is the preferred technique. This delicately pulls out the EWC out of the substrate, um, ensuring no snapping of the plant. Um, which can cause regrowth in the same season. The goal here is to hand pull the entire plant before the seeds drop to prevent the seed growth um, for years to come. And uh, we actually had two canoes and a small motorboat, uh, which provided us with emergency exits. And obviously um, pulling from a canoe, you need to be very comfortable and stable. So by the end of the summer, um, the technicians, uh, the team was very um, comfortable in being in canoes. And the canoes also provided us with the option to go into small spaces, you know, um, underneath uh, fallen logs and like places that we wouldn't be able to get in with the uh, motorboat. Um, this also shows uh, the, how if we were to snap a plant, how the Welland River is not very forgiving in color. So we wouldn't be able to see if we, snapped a rosette or a plant off of um, the stem, and we wouldn't be able to see it um, to pull the whole entire plant. And the goal is to pull the whole plant before the seeds drop. So in order to do this, we had to um, make sure that the whole plant uh, was pulled. And if we snapped it, we would just drop a pin um, on our, our, our phones to so we could go back and pull it um, when the new, the regrowth had happened. Um, so just to make note of that. So the biomass disposal, just quickly, um, we buy, we disposed it off at the Chippewa Creek Conservation Area. They had a green waste site. Um, the bins were transported with lids um, from um, where we would um, temporarily uh, dispose of 
in um, this red pine plantation at uh, E.C. Brown Conservation Area. This was all removed um, by the end of the, the first summer. And then by the second summer, we just ended up bringing everything to the, the green waste pile at Chippewa Creek, which uh, was far away from any water body and um, also our home base. So it was very convenient for us. Just a little bit on community outreach. We um, decided uh, that to uh, host these paddle with a purpose tours. And this was uh, a key thing to get recreational paddlers out um, to learn how to identify European water chestnut, to see it on the river, you know, assuming that these are the eyes on the river when we're not here and in other river uh, bodies of water. Um, so they were taught how to identify it and how to report it to EdMaps. They also had a chance to pull some, which they obviously really enjoyed. Um, and then just a quick note on the waterfront landowner letter. Um, we were out on the water every day and we had a lot of landowners come up to us um, and the landowner letter helped uh, to know what we were doing. And if they had any questions, they could contact us or uh, give us a wave while we were out there every day. So the results, um, in 2022, the team removed 7,000 plants from the river. Um, and what you see here are levels of infestation we recorded throughout the 33 kilometer stretch um, and what we removed. We removed the plant using Rubbermaid containers, which contained an average of 100 plants at each. And we had a total of 70 bins removed at the end of the pulling season. Um, and the, the levels of infestation are represented by yellow being sections of river with no chestnut, orange being a section of river with zero to 400 chestnuts, and um, the red being a high infestation ranging from 401 to 800 plants. Um, and as you can see, the red parts are, are smaller, which was very good for us. Um, so it was kind of hands on, all hands on deck in these areas, and we were able to remove um, everything out before the seeds fell. Um, this is, I, I apologize for the blurry picture, but this is kind of an idea of what a red would look like, a red polygon would look like. Um, as you can see, the shapes of the chestnut in this area um, mixed in with native uh, uh, vegetation as well, but also um, kind of pushed up against forming, starting to form uh, what we would know as a dense mat. Um, so important for us to get out of there, get that stuff out of there before um, it became even worse. And then this is an example of uh, the orange polygon, which is, you know, more sporadic throughout the Welland River and um, definitely something we had to attend to as well. So these are compared results from the 2023 season. Um, in purple, uh, and on the purple dots, it's on top of the polygons from the first, uh, sorry, from the 2022 season. With a smaller um, amount of EWC on the river, we decided to drop pins for each plant we pulled out of the river, and there was a huge reduction. Um, the, this, uh, in 2023, we pulled around 1,000 plants. Um, the red polygon in 2022, um, this one in specifically here, uh, represented as much as 400 to 800 plants, and we only pulled 169 plants out of there this year. And I can tell you just visually being on the river, the reduction from that area to from 2022 to 2023 was crazy. So um, it's just cool to see that uh, such a the rapid response created such a rapid change in just a year. So what's next for the EWC rapid response in Welland? Um, so due to the rapid response efforts, we've seen a successful reduction in EWC from, from one year to another. Um, with that comes the challenge of unpredictability and of the population um, size per year, year to year. Um, but we will still be on the river removing chestnut. Um, there's always a constant push and pull between the effort needed to remove all the plants and the uh, natural reduction in work linked to the successful eradication progress. So we will continue to remove the annual growth of um, EWC on the Welland River in 2024, ensuring to pull all the seed, uh, all the plants before the seed drops and um, continue surveying and monitoring the extent of 
the infestation and surveying surrounding water bodies. And um, we'd like to increase community involvement through events and paddling events. Um, and that's it for me. Great, thank you so much, Katie, for that presentation. I'm so great to hear about the successes with that. 7,000 plant, uh, I can't even imagine. Um, amazing <laughs> job. And the fact it started with uh, reporting from someone in the public is just such an amazing thing. So um, kudos to you. Um, okay, so we have um, a question for you, Katie. Uh, do you know why the level of infestation was higher in some areas than others? Um, the best way I can describe it um, is, so the plants do float. Um, there had, we did pull floating plants out of the river. Um, so, you know, think about a floating, uh, a, uh, the stem of the plant, it breaking off from the plant and being able to establish uh, somewhere else in the river. I can only imagine that um, they, the chestnuts, you know, found a spot that they liked um, that was maybe close to no moving of the river and um, it just preferred to grow in that spot. Great, thank you so much. I was wondering that too. Um, all right, well, um, we're right on time actually. Um, so uh, for any follow-up question, uh, Katie's email is in the chat. Um, and yes, thank you so much, Katie, uh, for uh, sharing with us today. Thank you. Okay, um, so that um, wraps up this last session of the forum. Uh, thank you to the speakers uh, for coming out and sharing your um, expertise and time and uh, research. It's It's been great to hear. I'll hand off to Maddie now. Thanks so much, Nicole. Wow, I can't believe it's the end of our annual Invasive Species Forum. The week absolutely flew by. Um, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers, moderators, and attendees over these past four days. We really appreciate all of you, and you really helped make it a truly incredible event. I'll turn it over to our amazing executive director, Sarah Rang, to officially close out the forum. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks so much, Maddie. And uh, thank you so much, uh, all of you, for being part of the annual Invasive Species Forum uh, hosted by the Invasive Species Center. Uh, my name is Sarah Rang. I'm the uh, honored to be the executive director of the Invasive Species Center. I'd like to thank uh, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry uh, for their ongoing support of the Invasive Species Centre and also the forum, uh, which enabled it to be offered free of charge and so uh, allows the greatest number of people to participate as possible. And participate, you did. Uh, we had record attendance of over a thousand people, a, a new forum record who tuned in over the, over the past four days. We've also uh, been able to reach people from far-flung areas, from Italy, uh, Ethiopia, um, Dominican Republic, and coast to coast across Canada. Uh, we've traveled Ontario, Canada, and the U.S. and learned uh, about forest and aquatic and plant invasive, courtesy of our wonderful 60 speakers. And uh, just a brief highlight on a couple of the themes that we've heard over the past uh, four days. Um, many of you noticed uh, that the spread of invasive species appears to be increasing on the landscape, um, you know, from Indigenous groups such as Shawanaga First Nation, noting that they're seeing increases in, in some of their invasive plants, uh, to more global kind of assessments as well that uh, we heard about today from our keynote speaker, Peter Stote, uh, who talked about the international panel on, on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, so the awareness of invasive species is also continuing to grow and many of you who work in this field uh, probably don't have to kind of uh, explain it to your friends and family quite so much. Uh, we notice a general awareness of the impacts uh, increasing. And just one example we heard through the forum was uh, from the city of Niagara Falls who noted that they had estimated the uh, early impacts of invasive species, you know, and the potential for that on one municipality in Ontario, looking at a potential 45% reduction or 13,000 trees being potentially affected by 
invasive species in their local tree inventory. So just a small kind of early example of uh, what we're seeing on the municipal and local landscapes. And many of you were working in terms of integrating this awareness into um, sort of land management programs across uh, Ontario and Canada as well. And so we're seeing invasive species prevention and management in Indigenous communities, woodlots, forests, uh, uh, cottager groups, land trusts, urban parks. It's really wonderful and incredible the amount of invasive species work that's going on on the landscapes, thanks to all of you. And this kind of growing component of seeing invasive species as a, as a component of uh, landscape restoration is really where we're all thinking. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, been able to showcase some of the new innovations and tools on invasive species, you know, new methods of detecting invasive species from drones to eDNA and back again, and also new tools um, for actually monitoring and reporting on invasive species as well. And uh, some of you noted new management methods for dealing with invasive species uh, um, in some of your presentations. And in general, I think we heard a growing call for new methods and all of us to work in terms of developing new methods for prevention and management of invasive species. On the policy front, uh, we saw progress uh, from the Ministry of Natural Resources in their presentation in terms of listing new invasive species under the Invasive Species Act and, um, and also watercraft for control uh, pathway as well. And the new review of the Ontario Invasive Species Strategic Plan. Globally, we've got a new international convention on biodiversity for a new framework and uh, federally as well, you know, the development of a new Canadian biodiversity strategy. And of all of these have uh, important links to invasive species for us to explore. So together, uh, we are making progress in terms of our knowledge of invasive species, our ability to detect invasive species, so their impacts and their management. And we've heard this over the past uh, four days. Um, because invasive species never sleep, I just wanted to highlight some upcoming events for us to continue our conversation together. Uh, as we noted on the first day, our uh, granting programs, uh, the Invasive Species Action Fund call for proposal is uh, going to be opening on March the 6th. Um, so this is a, a, a granting program designed to help nonprofits and community groups and land managers uh, to help them manage invasive species. We also are pleased to host the Invasive Pragmites Control Fund as well, uh, which was uh, specifically targeted towards Phragmites management. And so we're uh, expecting to open a call for proposals uh, for the Phragmites Fund a bit later this spring. Um, just an early notification to get your ideas rolling, um, thinking about what you might like to do. Uh, please sign up for our early notification on the programs on our Invasive Species Centre website. And uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll be together again on Invasive Species Awareness Week, uh, February the 23rd to March the uh, 4th. And uh, the Invasive Species Centre and many different partners have free materials for you to use this week. Uh, share on social media, uh, please customize them in any way that makes sense to you and your organization. Um, joining in can be as simple as just uh, uh, putting something up on social media or retweeting other uh, organizations as well. And it's really a great way for all of us to kind of bring an attention to invasive species. If you're interested in aquatic invasive species, I encourage you to consider the International Conference of Aquatic Invasive Species, which is happening this year in Halifax, uh, May the 12th to the 16th. Uh, the Invasive Species Centre is a co-host along with uh, Dalhousie University and the Government of Nova Scotia, and we'll be highlighting uh, lots of different innovations in particular on invas aquatic invasives. So just wanted to close the forum. A uh, big thank you to you for participating, to all our speakers who shared their knowledge. And uh, particularly just wanted to thank our hardworking uh, Invasive Species Centre team who put this event together. So Deb Sparks, Lauren Rogers, Madison uh, Sturba, who you've seen over the days, both in front of the camera and behind the camera, and all the ISC team members who moderated the sessions and spoke and supported program development. And a big thank you to you for sharing your time with us. Um, and we're 
Uh, always looking for new partners and projects, so don't hesitate to reach out to any of us uh, with any of your ideas. So together, I think we've made big strides forward over the last four days. I hope that you've had an opportunity to hear a few new things, uh, virtually potentially meet a new partner, learn about a complimentary project, and most importantly, to be inspired uh, to continue your great work on invasive species. So uh, just like to formally declare that the annual Invasive Species Forum 2024 is now closed. Hope you'll continue to join with us and partner with us uh, in the future. We're uh, going to be distributing a, a survey uh, just to help us plan for next year as well. So big thank you to all of you. Uh, hope to see you again soon.